let us all that we can to build a better future. We've been talking a lot here on Hard Lens Media, I mean a lot, about issues of who controls the media. It's no longer just a matter of free speech. It is who controls the means of distribution at a point in history when people's media habits are completely different. I believe the Pew, uh, the Pew Trust did a uh, survey last year. It showed that 90% of Americans are getting their news uh, through online sources. And this means that people's media habits have complete, been completely altered. As a result, many people are relying on social media, things like Twitter, uh, Facebook, but also um, Google and Google searches uh, and news to get, the, get, to get their media. And, if, and this gives these companies, these meg, mega corporations, Silicon Valley, gives them the ability to really control the narrative, right. to see mm -hmm. who sees what. We here at Hard Lens Media recently had to endure that. A lot of other independent content creators have done so as well. Now, there's also been another issue, and that is the issue of legacy media. We're talking about newspapers. We're talking about radio and uh, satellite, you know, not satellite, but um, terrestrial news and uh, broadcast radio. This sort of thing these, these organizations have also taken a massive hit, so much so that in many areas there is no longer a small town newspaper that oh, serves no. areas. There are no longer professional journalists who have beats. Uh, you know, who have their various beats, who are attending city council meetings, who are going into small towns or even large towns. We don't even have a lot of these experts here in Chicago anymore, uh, including professional uh, pr professional photographers that work, photojournalists that work for our local newspapers or professional photo editors. So we've already seen this happen in, in, in large and small media groups. And journalism in some areas has become so unprofitable that that you have hedge funds mm -hmm. that have taken over. These are not even publishing companies. These are hedge funds that have taken over publishing groups so that they can extract whatever value is there and essentially leave an, an empty shell of what used to be a journalistic enterprise. So the powers that be in both the Congress and the Senate uh, have decided that they're going to figure out a way around this. And I found out about this today. Uh, I was doing some work. No, you, actually, yesterday I was doing some research. And they're trying to pass the Journalism Competition and Preservation Act. And there have been some hearings on this. And I, the idea here is it would suspend antitrust laws to allow media companies to band together to collectively bargain with the big internet companies and social media uh, outlets. All right. Um, so in other words, that they're going to allow publishing groups which are may already be run by hedge funds and have no particular interest in journalism they're going to allow all of these organizations to come together uh, form another monopoly and to try and take on um silicon valley now uh th th there's so many problems with it. Look, I understand that they want to do what was going on in Australia with News Corp, yeah. where News Corp wanted um, Facebook and Google to pay them uh, for the news that they were streaming. And they it, they do have a, a certain point. I agree with Daniel's point that this was Murdoch stomping his feet. But I think that you know, we understand the issue here is that Tra traditional journalism, uh, journalistic outlets have had real problems making any money because advertising on their sites isn't particularly working. It is not paying the bills. Meanwhile, you have social media companies that can take content that's being shared by their by their own users and stream that and have the headlines and have blurbs and have discussions and they can siphon up all the ad revenue on their own platforms because after all, they're not paying journalists. Right. Well, you know. To do the reporting uh, and I get that okay I get that but what has been pointed out is that in Australia um, the Australian courts had you did not have one thing that they could do they could not break the monopoly uh, that say Google or Amazon or 
Facebook have because they're not Australian companies. They, they just can't mm -hmm. break the monopoly. Mm -hmm. So now we're here in the U.S. There's the possibility of breaking a monopoly. And what gets proposed here? Um, cre <laughs> creating another monopoly, which is precisely what journalist Glenn Greenwald, probably one of the few journalists I respect anymore, said when he was giving his statement about all this. And he pointed out that, yes, yeah, social media, and he documented this, how social media has been known to manipulate and control the news and what people see, what people find out. He said, but creating another monopoly is not going to help matters. And I have this article here from um, Ra Radio and Television Business Report. It is a premium subscription service that I get because I want to be able to share this information with you. But they pointed out that um, the cord one of the provisions in all this is one of the, uh, the coordination between the news publishers is only allowed if it directly relates to the quality, accuracy, attribution, or branding, or interoperability of news, benefits the entire industry other than just a few publishers, and is non-discriminatory to other news publishers, and is directly related to and reasonably necessary for these negotiations instead of being used for other purposes. But the point they make here is, who is the arbiter? Who makes the decision as to what is good news or bad news? We already know. We already know that there are journalistic enterprises that want to silence other journalists because they are not subscribing to or not promoting the narrative that some journalists want to promote. This is already happening here, yep. and I, you know, I, I strongly urge you the. Um, the Electronic uh, uh, Frontier Foundation has weighed in on this. Glenn Greenwald has weighed in on this. I strongly urge you to check this out because I think that, you know, one of the things they're pointing out here, it, in, in fact, the title of the EFF's uh, article on this, uh, an antitrust exemption for news media won't take us back to the time before big tech. The reality is, is that the genie is out of the bottle. People have changed their media habits. I do subscribe to the Wall Street Journal's weekend edition. Uh, and I confess that I do enjoy sitting uh, with my roommate and my cats drinking coffee and we exchange parts of the, the paper together. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is, is that most of us would have to retrain ourselves to mm -hmm. go back to these ways of getting news. I actually think it might be healthier and better for us, but that's a discussion for another time. We've got a serious, serious problem in this country that's been documented by journalists and activists and concerned citizens alike. This approach is not going to work, and all that it's possibly going to do is benefit the big media companies, which in some cases, are no longer even media companies, but hedge funds. Exactly. Um, here, go ahead, Daniel. The, here's the big thing along with this. This is why it's like, okay, so you know, obviously we're in the stand. Our stance is very, hey, wouldn't it be nice if regular people like us had a fair shot at competing? Now, I'm not asking for a priority shot. I would be like NBC if I was to ask that. But the problem I look at it is, at least with American uh, news, let's call it entertainment, news fotainment, maybe is the best way to phrase all this is 92% controlled by six companies. Yeah. So even if this bill comes in and we get this new monopoly, that would mean us and every other uh, journalistic organization on YouTube, on all social media, plus all of the papers that are left that are independent, the college papers, everything would have to band together to get an 8% share. That seems a little untenable to me in terms of actually making this work out. It really does feel like something that will just cause more consolidation amongst yeah. the very few remaining papers. Because like Lenny, I, I think you said it exactly, is it just creates another monopoly. And the problem of the era is that there's too much monopoly. And there's also something else here too, and that is the severe distrust of the media mm -hmm. by the populace because the same corporations that own our politicians are the same entities that own our media. You know, it wasn't too long ago where I covered how BuzzFeed, uh, uh, BuzzFeed, <laughs> uh -huh, mm -hmm. BuzzFeed bought a uh, HuffPost, you know, and how eventually like again what what are we seeing we're seeing all these major media outlets 
uh, being bought up, being cannibalized by corporations or venture uh, or venture capitalists. Look what's happening to the Chicago Tribune. I yeah. mean, it's being bought up. Laney, you talked about it. Daniel, I know you talked about it as well. How this venture capitalist organization is hedge buying fund. Yeah, a hedge fund. Thank you. Thank you. A hedge fund is basically buying the Chicago Tribune. And again, are they going to be covering stories? Are they going to be covering uh, what's happening in Springfield or in City Hall? Probably not. And at the end of the day, it's a story that Laney covered, especially during the height of the COVID-19 lockdowns, how people, how journalists are being laid off, how you've got uh, studios boarding up shop, how, uh, again, like they're they're just they're limiting the amount of stories that they can cover. And if this is the fate of journalism here in the United States, well, then it's no wonder why people have given up on the media or trusting any sources or or is it at just reading the headline, just going along with it? Because again, when you look at the articles, they're not covering what's really going on. And it, this is why we need to have independent media. I've said on the show, especially in 2020, that once we walk out of this disaster, we might be one of the last few bastions of real press in this city. On the one hand, that's good. On the other hand, that's absolutely terrifying. It stinks. It, it's terrifying. Yeah. Because so many, because there is, there's only so much we can do. Yeah. But then as, as we grow, we're going to have to fill in that void. Yeah, it, it, it is disturbing. Um, and it is, as I said, it, it's, it's, it's a predicament, not a problem. Because as the FF points out, we can't just hop back. Uh, to way, the way things were. It, it's just, you know, business models have changed. People's habits have changed. People's neurology have ch yeah. ha has changed. And we, you have to consider that when, fa finding a, a, when finding some way of addressing this. One, I think, would be to break up the big tech monopolies. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, I, I honestly think that that would be helpful. Um, but I think there also has to be a shift in consumer sentiment. If you're not going to go back to reading the daily paper, and I'm not going to blame you if you're not, if you're not, what are you prepared to do to pay for journalism? One of the things that I noticed, I noticed a lot on Facebook, is you'll see articles. Um, you know, the, you'll, you'll go through your news feed, there'll be somebody has linked an article, there's been an article there, and you'll see a bunch of comments under it, well, it's behind a paywall. I don't want to have to pay. I don't want to have to pay to read this. Why do you put your articles behind a paywall? Well, they have to pay their journalists. They have to mm -hmm. pay their writers. They have to pay their photographers. They have to pay their web developers. They have to pay for this. You know, this is costing money, but many consumers don't seem to grasp that. And they are perfectly willing to wait until, say, a second or third tier blog or news site basically scrapes the information and you know rewards it and puts it up on, on, on their platform. Um, this is, you know, if, a cons if consumers value what quality journalists are capable of doing, then they are going to have to re have to adjust how they are consuming news. Even if they don't go back to a physical paper or a radio station or television, they may need to be more willing to pay for the news that they consume. And I would even say that even if we can't get like to some, I've heard some arguments that that were like this interesting point of the, if they can't break up Google because then it will immediately reconstitute back into Google because people only choose the first best search. But blah, blah 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 doesn't really matter in this case. Um, the issue is not only about exactly what we're talking about, which is that it, the consumer habits have changed, paywalls. I think also you have Americans just don't have the discretionary spending to spend on a recurring or multiple recurring subscriptions like they used to when most Americans had a little bit of discretionary income. It also is a consequence of many of these same papers or just sort of a consequence of other papers just not being good and not yeah. being good for a very long time, which has just destroyed the reputation of so many. Like the only places that really can even charge a paywall are the people who or the places that haven't had that sort of an attack happen to them. Their credibility is still there. But at the same time, then you're putting all the credible organizations that are paying their people still behind the paywall, which means that it doesn't effectively change from the point of view of people that are just going to go on Facebook anyway to get, as you put it, like a re-scrape news that's from someone else mm -hmm. so that they don't even associate that organization with doing good journalism. Like Wall Street Journal is still well-regarded, just maybe yeah. not their opinion section, but their work is still well-regarded. But if you can't afford a subscription, how does it matter? What does it matter to you? How do you know? Yeah. Why does it, why does it matter? So it's so many factors that have come together over 
really the last uh, like 20 years, but it's really as news has gone from trying to inform people on what's happening to fighting with the internet model to succumbing to it and sort of becoming a, a joke of itself. And then also the consolidation that was really, I would say if we want to blame someone or something, uh, it's Bill Clinton's tele uh, telecommunication act, because that's where all this happened. We used to have thousands of different local news sources, radio, television, magazine, whatever. It's now basically six companies. There's something else I want to add in too, in regards towards how journalism is presented to the American people. And that is this, and it's very disturbing to really think about it. It's not only is corporate media there to kind of talk to us, but they're there to placate us and tell us everything's okay. That don't worry about everything. It's fine. We're going to move on now to the next story. Here's what's happening in this part of the world. We're going to talk about for like maybe three minutes. And now, oh, wait, here's a cute dog story now. Here's a feel good story to make you feel okay. Don't worry about anything else. And the thing is, is uh, uh, that model, that whole mindset that, that we're getting from corporate media just doesn't work. And they don't want to change that because if they ever did, and they told people, hey, here's what's really happening. It's going to make a lot of people uncomfortable. And for them, that's a bad business model because look at the corporations that own the media. Because as soon as the media does its job and starts investigating those said corporations, the bottom line gets taken out. Yeah. yeah if, 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 there, if anything, watch the movie uh, Good Night and Good Luck. And yeah. just to kind of end, go with all this again, this is a lot of people's fault that has led to this yeah. but it's in a sense not something we could even blame because it's already here it's, it's already, a predicament it's, it's not a problem it's yeah, a predicament exactly and it's like what are solutions let's stop talking about what's wrong what are solutions well you could obviously re-break up all the news companies so they go back from their six back into thousands that'd be really nice i'd like that even if you can't break up or whatever it is even if breaking up is not a, an option or if it is that's an option right there I think it'd be nice if like, I would prefer to be on a YouTube where two major changes, ready? Uh, they don't get to prioritize who wins or who loses in viewership because remember NBC used to regularly get 2000 viewers per video, not too, dis not too different than us, maybe like twice the numbers we got because no one liked them because they weren't any good. And now they get 75% of the entire algorithm, whereas we're scavenging for what's left. So make it so that people actually get to choose their news and YouTube isn't picking it for us. Let the meritocracy do its thing. And then the other thing is just break apart the actual news conglomerates. They don't need to be as big as they are. Maybe say no place can have more than a nationwide you can't have more than five percent control with one company i don't know something like that and there used to be laws that for example would not allow um a newspaper to own a radio station or vice versa i mean and though they they were not always in place they were at one point um and then they they th those rules ended and again you know it, it, there's something to be said for protecting the this institution uh, a free press is an is a, a bedrock mm -hmm. of, the fourth state. of yeah the, the the United States. I will end with one thing. I would encourage you after you've watched Civically Minded and after you've watched Kit's interview, um, I would encourage you to go on YouTube and look up Walter Cronkite's announcement of the Kennedy assassination. Don't go for the one that's about five minutes. Go for the one that's a little like an hour and five minutes. And what you're going to see is an, a, a video, an, an exact recording of how people in the United States got the news from Walter Cronkite that President Kennedy had been shot and eventually died. And what you'll see at the beginning, for example, is that you'll see, he won't even see Cronkite's face because they had to warm up the cameras. Mm -hmm. So they were going to, they were interrupting, mm -hmm. I think it was guiding light or something like that. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and announcing this, and then they brought, they brought it to Walter Cronkite. What you will notice is that he will not, he absolutely will not make a statement about what happened uh, until he has absolute confirmation. It takes over an hour to get that information. And he said, yes, we have testimony from um, two priests who gave uh, President Kennedy last rites that they believed he was dead. Our man on the ground, Dan Rather, mm -hmm. he said, believes that he is, but we don't know this yet. And he's like, 
trying, he's trying to hold it together. You can see that the man is getting ready to just lose it right there on the air, which he did not do. He was talking about Jackie Kennedy's pink outfit, which was very fetching. He's trying to fill in because he was not going to pronounce anything until he had the information. Then you see them hand him the flash. You know, President Kennedy is dead. And I urge you to watch that. Not, it's incredibly moving, but it gives you an idea of just what it was back then um, for these guys to actually want to give the American public the truth because they understood that that was their responsibility as journalists. I urge you to watch it. It's something else. Can you imagine that today? I still like the moment. I still remember the very moment I completely lost all confidence in CNN. It was when that Malaysian flight crashed. Oh my God! It in kept the covering Indian Ocean, that. and they Waste and it was it was the moment specifically. It was specifically the moment when um, Don Lemon said to an expert, "Could this have been a black hole?" Yeah, so a black hole in our atmosphere. Hole. Yeah. Well, you know, and I remember when Ronald Reagan was shot, and I remember watching the broadcast with my family and my grandparents, and they were they announced that he was dead. And I remember at one point, I think it was Dan Rather, although I'm not sure, he said, mm -hmm, we, we, need to get, we need to get it right. He swore right there on the air. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, we need, to, we need to get it right. And they were, you know, right then we started to see, we, start, we were seeing that kind of slipping mm -hmm. uh, because they, they wanted to give the public instant news. Guess what? News isn't always instant. Mm -hmm. We know this. How long did Woodward and Bernstein work on the Watergate? Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to get this stuff instantly, but we have our neurology is now primed for instant news so again uh watch this uh, information check out greenwald's testimony check out what's being written about it and you know let your representative and senators know that no this is not in my view this is not the best way to handle the problem of journalism here in the u.s